so I'm going to talk about the evidence of Zavra Bay as a critical site for reef manta rays, Mobula alfredi, in Mozambique. Um, so reef mantas belong to the family Mobulidae, and this family consists of a highly threatened, highly migratory uh, group of rays. Um, it also consists of, of the reef manta, which is the most recently evolved elasmobranch, and with that comes um, these uh, derived traits such as case-selected life history traits. Um, reef mantas only give birth to one pup every one to two years, and they have extremely late maturation, making them very vulnerable to overexploitation. Um, they also have the largest brain-to-body size ratio of all fish, um, and it's made them a, like a very charismatic animal, and they actually have brought a lot of attention to Mozambique through ecotourism. Um, so they're very uh, economically important. Um, in the Inyamban province alone, manta tourism is worth uh, 12.7 million U.S. dollars with an economic impact of 40 million U.S. dollars a year. Um, so they're worth a lot more money alive than dead. Uh, and this is being shown across the world, not just in Mozambique. And if you consider that it's a developing country, they're, they're getting a lot of money through this sustainable ecotourism. Um, but despite their value, reef mantas are listed on the IUCN as vulnerable, um, likely to be updated to endangered, um, and that's due to global population decline. Uh, in Tofu, Mozambique, it's been reported uh, from 2003 to 2016, a 98% decline in sightings. This is the largest sightings decline reported anywhere around the world for reef mantas. So it's potentially the most threatened uh, population in the world. Uh, and this is largely due, mostly due to directed fisheries for the Mobula gillraker market. Um, so there's a, a tonic that is supposed to help clear out toxins from your body um, using the gillrakers from uh, Mobula rays and manta rays, which is the organ that filter feeds uh, zooplankton. Um, but there's zero science back behind it. It's just another case of rhino horn. Um, and it's actually harmful for you to ingest this because there's levels of cadmium and arsenic uh, in these organs. Um, there are, there's also issues of bycatch. Um, so gill nets are the main threat um, in terms of uh, local artisanal fisheries, uh, but you can't really blame them. They are trying to make a living and we're working alongside fishermen to address their needs. Um, and it's actually not really a problem when you consider the fact that the Mozambican government has just given five years of legal fishing rights to foreign vessels. So that's our main issue, really. Um, yeah, so the, the main aggregation zone is from Zavra in the southernmost part up to Bazaruto. It's about 350 kilometers aggregation. Um, so Dr. Andrea Marshall kind of pioneered the research in Mozambique with a focal point uh, in tofu. Uh, and Tofu also experienced uh, rapid unmanaged tourism, so some people do believe that that sightings decline um, may be affected by that as well. Um, we're not sure. And then you have up in the north, Bazaritu is a national park. Um, they still have high levels of manta sightings there. Um, they also have bull sharks, uh, humpback whales, dugongs. That's now being threatened by the Sassel Mining Company. Um, or sorry, drilling company, where they want to uh, conduct seismic uh, testing and offshore drilling right outside the national park. And then finally, where we're based, um, we're in Zavra at the southernmost part, and we also still have high sightings of, of mantas, um, but nothing has yet been published from the area, so we're kind of the, the missing link at this point. Uh, so we're using photographic mark recapture um, by using their unique and permanent uh, ventral spot patterning. Um, and this, is, this provides uh, the foundation for manta research across the world. Um, so we're just looking at very basic uh, characteristics of Zavra just to kind of see, okay, is this a significant place for mantas? What might be going on there? Um, so looking at males and females, juveniles, etc. And the database is from 2010 to 2019. Uh, and then just quickly, to determine between males and females, we just looked at their pelvic fins. So the males have claspers, that, um, and when they're mature, they extend past their uh, pe pectoral fins. 
And then the females um, will always have pelvic fins no matter their maturity. So for the males A and B, that's when they're, when they're immature. Um, the claspers don't extend past. Females, it's much more difficult to determine maturity because um, we don't have, uh, they have their internal reproductive organs. Um, but we're able to um, record when they're pregnant. They're very obviously pregnant. They have a pup that's happy for mating scars. Um, so just some results. So we found actually a strong seasonality. Um, there was a significant increase of mantis sightings between July and November. Um, and I find even more interesting that actually 97% of our total sightings occurred at one shallow reef. So this is a, just a cleaning station um, and only 12 meters depth. So that's extreme site fidelity. Site fidelity. Uh, the past studies in tofu identified several reefs that they use, but um, in Zavar we're only seeing just this one reef. Perhaps there's one that we haven't yet explored, um, but yeah over a thousand sightings at just this one reef. Um, and we identified 515 individuals from 2010 to August 2019. Um, so if you look at the gray, that's the number of new individuals identified each year, and in black is the number of re-sightings. So you can see before 2017, um, they're still identifying new rays, um, and you can see the black line is actually the ratio of resites to new, new identifications, and that's starting to taper off, so that kind of tells us we're starting to, uh, we're seeing way more resites than new IDs, so maybe we're starting to get um, uh, a picture of this population. Uh, and then 41.8% were recited, um, which is actually quite a high number considering our low sampling effort. We're a very tiny little village with one dive center, and we only go out once a day or once a week, or depends on the weather. But anyway, it's quite a high recite uh, percentage considering that sampling effort. And then 36.5% were resonant. That means they were seen across uh, multiple sampling years. Uh, and then the other 63.5% were uh, considered transient, so only seen in one sampling year. Um, so in addition to that uh, residency and resightings, um, this here is tripod. You can see her uh, spot pattern. It looks like the tripod for a camera. Uh, she's been seen a total of 16 times. Um, and she was also pregnant at one stage uh, and then not visibly pregnant the next year. Um, so you can see these mantas are repeatedly coming back to the site. Um, our minimal period between resites was one day and up to 3,243 days. So these, these mantas that are still considered transient could have returned and we just might not have captured them yet. Um, and the mean number of resites was 2.25, 225. Uh, and then another very interesting finding uh, was the even sex ratio we have. So uh, in pink you have the total females. So in dark pink is our mature individuals, so we've seen them pregnant or with a mating scar. Uh, and then in light pink is the maturity cannot be determined. Uh, and then with the males, that's blue and light blue. Um, the ju there's only 26 juvenile males. And then also in orange is the sex cannot be determined. Um, so this contrasts to the previous data from Tofu, which found a 78% female um, bias population. Um, and it's interesting because uh, we think they might be using Zavra as a mating site or a courting site because of this even sex ratio and because there's so little juvenile males seen. Uh, and then we want to look at across years, so is this a consistently an even sex ratio? Um, and you can see, so from number one, that's 2010 up till 2019, um, the total number of rays identified is kind of hovering above the bars, and males are in black, females are in gray, and um, white is unknown. Um, so you can see quite how even it is throughout the years. Um, we also see a number of instances of um, mating trains and breaching, which is also associated with reproductive behavior. So this could be a critical reef for, for their mating. Um, and then going back into kind of the maturation uh, rates. Um, so past studies have found uh, ma male mantas to mature maybe three to six years 
and others to mature um, up to 10 years. We found this uh, mat immature male to still be immature uh, after seven years. And then we also, also found a number, number of anthropogenic impacts. Um, so we found a uh, manta trapped in a gill net. Um, sorry, time's running out, so I'm gonna speed up. Uh, and we've also found a number of cephalic fin amputations. So going back to my talk from yesterday, these are an indicator of fishing impact. So um, this manta in the middle uh, lost her cephalic fin um, in the last year. Uh, and that's likely from monofilament wrapping around their face. And then this poor guy here, Stumpy, um, he's lost both his cephalic fins. So we found about a 10% uh, 10 of our population to have amputated cephalic fins. Um, so the next steps, uh, so in addition to this basic population data, we want to use Pollock's robust design to estimate apparent survival, temporary immigration, and capture probability and abundance of M. Alfredi and Zavra. Um, and we also want to combine this data with the databases from Bazarutu and Tofu so we can actually get a much bigger picture on the connectivity and the trends of Mozambique's mantas. Um, and then I just wanted to reiterate uh, Ryan and, and Katie's points from earlier about how important it is to consider that these animals don't have boundaries and um, management plans that work in South Africa are great, but we're uh, really struggling with, with the government in Mozambique. So if you can help spread the word and help, um, yeah, help fight for protection of our animals there. Um, yeah, and then also Zebra should be included as an MPA. Okay, thank you.